Torgus and Petal walks at the margins, um, predictably. Uh, despite the revival of interest in Marx since the economic crisis hit, some important ideological and conceptual barriers continue to block what will be a very positive step returning to Marx as the source of leftist critique of modern capitalism and modern society as a whole, and for the battle for the transcendence or overcoming the outcome of that system. In the past few decades, Marxist critics have fallen into two large groups, sometimes overlapping, of course. In neoliberal ideology, Marx is dead because he tried to take us beyond capitalism, to which there is no alternative. The radical experiment of the Soviet Union failed, as also said, thus invalidating Marx's supposedly impractical and utopian schemes from period. But at least in the circles in which most of us travel, progressive academia and the left, the critique of Marx has usually taken a different direction. In these quarters, it is said that the problem with Marx is not that he, that he was too radical, as the neoliberals say, but that he was not radical enough. Some add the truly radical thinkers are people like Foucault, Deleuze, and even Nietzsche. These critics, most famously Edward Said, attack Marx for adopting what they see as a unilinear model of development in the modernist mode. Postmodernists, as you know, term this a grand narrative. Here, much of the debate has revolved around Marx's early articles on India during the 1850s and a passage in the Communist Manifesto of 1848 on China. At a more general level, it is said even more often among progressives that Marx informs us on class and economic structures, but that his theoretical model does not incorporate race, gender, ethnicity, or nationalism at all, or at least not very much. I think responding to these critiques, especially the one coming from the progressive left, is as important as the earlier effort to separate Marx's original vision from Stalinism and totalitarianism, an effort that still remains necessary today. That link of Marx to Stalinism, although it might be invalid, is part of what has fostered the growth of anarchism among so many younger radicals today. In a culture saturated with negative images of Marx, it is virtually impossible to approach his writings for the first time without being affected by some of the definitions already provided by his critics. This presentation, based on my recent book, I will mention and respond to criticisms of Marx that have been coming from parts of the progressive left from which center on charges of unilinearism and grand narrative as well as ethnocentrism. Marx's critics have a point in terms of his early writings on India and China, I believe. Marx begins with a somewhat modernist and unilinear perspective toward India and China, but moves gradually toward a more multilinear and multicultural approach toward India and other non-Western societies. Here's my basic argument. <coughs> As noted by Edward Said and other critics, Marx's 1848 and 53 writings on India and China exhibit Orientalist notions of modernity, occasionally accompanied by ethnocentric ones, in which European colonialism is portrayed as a necessary stage on the road to a social development for societies trapped in an unchanging traditionalism. Marx begins to alter this perspective in the late 1850s, particularly in the Grimrissa and in his writings on anti-colonial resistance in India and China at that time. By the time of his later writings of 1879 to 82, just before his death, some of them still unpublished, Marx is moving toward a more anti-colonialist position and a more multilinear approach to social development in which certain pre-modern social forms, especially communal property, are seen as building blocks for an alternative form of modernity. So let me trace some of the evidence for such an evolution in Marxist thought and its theoretical consequences. In the Communist Manifesto of 1848, Marx and Engels write famously in praise of Western capitalist penetration of Asia, of its, as they say, battering down all Chinese walls, drawing even the most bar barbarian, barbaristic nations into civilization. It's their word. Here they seem to first view Western colonial incursions into Asia, including England's notorious first opium war against China of 1839 42, as on the whole a progressive and beneficial undermining of Oriental and what they see as barbarism. And second, to assume that the rest of the world was destined to follow in the footsteps of the more industrially advanced Western European nations. Marx and Engels praise this early stage of capitalist globalization in the manifesto 
can be seen as part of their overall sketch of the achievements of capitalism in Western Europe and North America, a sketch that is followed by a withering critique. However, they do not follow their praise of Western colonialism in Asia with a similar critique. Instead, Marx held in 1848 to an implicitly unilinear model of development in which India and China would, as they were swept more deeply into the world capitalist system, over time develop similar contradictions to those of the already industrializing countries. <coughs> These themes are developed further five years later in Marx's 1853 writings on India for the New York Tribune. As the Indian historian Irfan Habib notes, in some passages Marx evokes notions of an independent India shaking off the chains of British colonialism in these writings, something not mentioned by Edward Said. Marx also looks uh, at gender in his other writings in the same period, 1852 to 1853. But in terms of India, Marx attacks as well what he calls now the barbarism of British colonialism in India. But even here, if this is to be an India that is first modernized along Western European lines in an implicitly unilinear schema of development. Moreover, Marx's portrait of Indian culture in 1853 and society well, is often condescending. Here, following pretty closely the description a lot of it in Hegel's philosophy of history, Marx describes India as an unchanging society that lacks any real historical development except that introduced by various conquests from the Arabs and the Mughals to the British. The British represent, and that's his words, a superior <coughs> civilization. In the face of these conquerors over the centuries, he writes, India proved to be, quote, unresisting and unchanging society. The roots of the, this passivity and static social structure are said to lie in India's economically self-contained villages, which stifled individual development and social progress. In fact, Marx portrays the communal structures of these villages which he erroneously, erroneously sees as precluding the development of private property and land, as, as he puts it, the solid foundation of oriental destiny. By 1857, the anti-British sepoy uprising broke out in India, which led to two years of conflict in which the British almost lost control of the subcontinent. Marx enthusiastically supports the uprising, noting that the rebellious sepoy troops were themselves a product of British colonialism, there is something in history like retribution, he writes, and there's a rule of historical retribution that is instantly forged not by the offended, but by the offender himself, referring to the Seaport troops trained on by the British. For the next two years, also in the Tribune, he and Engels described the Seaport uprising and its brutal suppression by the British. Contrasting the uprising in India to the relative quiescence of European labor at that time, Marx declares tellingly in an 1858 letter to Engels India is now our best ally. By now he has assumed a more anti-colonialist position. By the late 1850s, Marx also shifts his attitude toward China, now strongly supporting the Chinese during the Second Opium War of 1856 to 60. Referred to the shelling of Canton, Guangzhou as we call it today, the harbor of Canton, and he writes, Unoffending citizens and peaceful tradesmen of Canton have been slaughtered, their habitations battered to the ground, and the claims of humanity violated on the flimsy pretense that, pretense that English life and property are endangered by the aggressive acts of the Chinese. These sweeping assertions are baseless. The Chinese have at least 99 injuries to complain of to one on the part of the English. As with India, Marx has moved toward a more anti-colonialist position. In 1857-58, during the same period of these conflicts in India and China, Marx also elaborates, for the first time, a multilinear theory of history in the Grandrissa and the Critique of Political Economy, in 1859, actually. This constituted a revision of his earlier conceptualization of three successive modes of production. First, the greco roman slave-based, ancient mode. Second, the medieval European, serf-based, feudal mode of production. And, fi and finally, the modern bourgeois mode of production based on formerly free wage labor. Referring mainly to India, Marx inserts alongside this Eurocentric model an Asiatic mode of production, suggesting that pre capitalist Asian societies were on a different historical trajectory than the European development from the ancient to the feudal modes of production. Moreover, although the so called Asiatic mode of production was said to be based on a rather static form of communal property, Marx no longer sees it as necessarily despised in the language of 1853, 
however, referring at one point in the Grand Rosa to democratic aspects of communal governance in pre-colonial Asian society. Marx picks up and develops these multilinear threads of argument in new ways during his last decade, 1872 to 1883. Three strands of his writings are important here. The first of these strands is found in the changes he introduced the 1872-75 French edition of Capital. That's important because it's not just journalism or novels, but it's writing in Capital. You can't go into that here, except to say that he left room in some alternate passages in the French edition for an alternative development for societies outside of Western Europe, including India, China, and Russia. This is in the section of primitive accumulation and a couple other places. I would like to mention, though, that the new Persian edition of Capital, I want to see it come up afterwards, published with tremendous difficulty in Tehran in 2007, is one of the few uh, editions of, in fact, the only widely circulated, recently priced one that I know of, that reflects these textual complexities through a system of marginal notes. And I want to also mention that it's one of its translators, Kaveh Boveri, is uh, with us today. It's very happy. The second strand of Marx's late writings on non-Western and pre-capitalist societies concerns Russia. In several texts, Marx examined anew the issue of whether Russia and the agrarian empires of Asia were destined to modernize in the Western man. In an 1877 letter responding to the discussion of capital by the Russian writer Mikhailovsky, Marx defends himself from the charge of unilinearism in part by citing the French edition of capital. Marx denies strongly that he has developed, as he calls it, a historical philosophical theory of the general course fatally imposed upon all modern parlance of grand narrative. Um, in his well, and also, a few years later, in a well-known 1881 letter, letter to the Russian revolutionary Vera Zazulis, just by historical coincidence, dated March 8, 1881. Uh, uh, the topic is, once again, whether Russia is destined to be swept into the pathway of capitalist development that is already taking place in Western Europe. Again, Marx concludes, that alternate pathways of development might be possible. He bases his judgment in large part upon the marked differences between the social structure of the Russian village with its communal property and the village under Western European feudalism's somewhat more individualized property relations. Marx adds that his recent studies of Russian society, his fluent in Russian by that time, as his reading novel, had uh, convinced me that the commune is the fulcrum for a social regeneration in Russia. In his far lengthier drafts for the letter to Zazulich, Marx indicates that versions of the communal social relations he is discussing in Russia could also be found in other non-Western societies at the time, such as India, but were not common in pre-capitalist Western Europe. In the 1882 preface to the Russian edition of the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels suggested that these communal social formations in Russia could form the starting point for a communist revolution if, and this is a big if, they could link up with the revolutionary labor movement in the Western capitalist land. The third strand in Marx's late writings on non-Western societies lies in his 1879-82 notebooks on colonialism, communal property, and gender in India, Indonesia, Algeria, Egypt, and other non-Western and pre-capitalist societies, some of which have yet to be published, but which I am helping to edit for the Marx Engels Mazam Pauska. <coughs> Marx took extensive notes on the young anthropologist Maxim Kowalewski's book Communal Land Ownership, published in Russian in 1879, most of which is devoted to India. Marx also annotated the young historian Robert Sewell's Analytic History of India, published in 1870. Marx's notes on the Indian subcontinent during this period are, are very substantial. They total I estimate 90,000 words. In his 1879 notes on Kowalewski, Marx follows the young Russian anthropologist's historical typology of communal forms in rural India, which consisted, according to Kowalewski, of several stages, moving from clan or kin-based communities to village communities, not organized around kinship, but periodically redivided the common land. Given the focus on broad changes in India's communal forms, it would appear that pre-colonial India was, for Marx, no longer an unchanging society without any real history, as in 1853. The second part of Marx's notion of Kowalewski on India, which deals 
with the impact of Muslim rule on these earlier social relationships calls forth a strong attack on the notion that pre-colonial India was feudal. Not only is he keeping away from such unilinear notions as he had in the Grinris, the start of the Grinris of two decades earlier, but he was also explicitly attacking those like Kowalewski who maintained the feudal interpretation of pre-colonial India. On the other hand, Kowalewski shared much of Marx's hostility to colonialism, which became clear in the third section of Marx's notes on Kowalewski on India, where Marx focused on the rise of British colonial domination up through the 1857-58 Seaport Rebellion. Marx strenuously attacks the scoundrel, as he calls it, Cornwallis' permanent <coughs> settlement of 1793, which created capitalist-style landed property in Indian villages at tremendous cost to the peasants. Marx also celebrates, again, the Sepoy uprising. Finally, again following Kowalewski's data, Marx concerns the continuation of communal forms in the villages underneath the more atomized capitalist structures introduced by the British. He writes, Nevertheless, among these atoms, social certain relationships endure from a distance reminiscent of the earlier landowning groups of the communal village. This suggests a link between Marx's notes on India and his late writings on Russia discussed above. If these communal relationships endured in India, might not also, as in Russia, serve as points of resistance. Capital. Marx supplements these anthropological notes with one on Indian political and military history in his notes on Sewell's analytical history. If the Kowalewski notes suggest that Marx no longer saw India as a society without history, those on Sewell he suggests that a second problematic feature of the 1853 writings on India was falling aside, the notion that India had responded passively to outside conquest. Again and again, Marx's notes emphasize the contingent character of the Muslim and British conquest rather than, as in 1853, the, the ineluctable march of large historical forces. At every stage, Marx now highlights indigenous Indian resistance to foreign conquest. For example, Marx records passages such as the following from Sewell, in, emphasizing how in 1704, the uh, Moroccan, Hindu Moroccan forces based near present-day Mumbai or Bombay had put the Mughal emperor on the defensive this before the British had gained much of a foothold in India. 1704, he writes, in the last four years of his life, whole government disorganized, Marathas began to recover their forts and gather strength, a terrible famine exhausted the provisions for troops and drained the treasury, the soldiers mutinous over wanting pay, hard pressed by the Marathas, the emperor retreats in great confusion. Ahmad Nagar. In another, in another description of the, of the Marathas, Marx uses the word clan ancestor, the German Stammvater, in a description of the Maratha leadership, thus highlighting the notion that the Marathas, who formed the most important locus of Indian resistance to both the Mughals and the British, were organized on a clan basis. None of the above is meant to suggest that Marx's notes on India are anti Muslim, for on numerous occasions he notes the considerable contributions of Muslims to India culture and society. Marx devotes the bulk of the notes on Sewell to the period of British ascendancy where he stresses the contingent character of Britain's conquest and the many instances where its power in India hung by a thread. He frequently terms the British blockheads or dogs, who he describes, well, I'll say actually what he says, I said, so terribly tight as shitting in their pants in the face of Indian resistance, he writes at one point. The news on the notes on Sewell suggest that Marx's sympathy for the 1857 Seaport uprising had only increased since the 1850s. To wrap this up, I'd like to say two things. First, Marx's critique of capital, as it has been shown, was far broader than is usually supposed. To be sure, he concentrated on the labor capital relation within Western Europe and North America. But at the same time, he expended considerable time and energy on the analysis of non Western society. These are also problems of our time, and it behooves us to see what we can learn from the ways in which Marx never separated these issues from the critique of capital, while also taking non-capitalist societies seriously as social actors. Second, the examination of these writings on India, China, and Russia helps us to discern a larger issue. Marx's growing hostility to capitalist modernity as he moved from the fulsome praise of modernity in the opening pages of the Manifesto to the Grinris's appreciation of capital's role in building up the productive forces of society to the much harsher critique of modernity elaborated in Capital Volume 1, particularly the chapters that goes on machinery, for example. In this sense, Marx's writings on Russia and on the global south help us to grasp better the depth of his critique of capital.
capitalism again. Thank you. daunting it is for me to be here after these two fantastic presentations and then primarily because you might have done be here. Uh, but you know, we do pronounce class the same way and differently from any of you today. You can accept my reading comments on her behalf. Um, I'm going to proceed in the reverse order because you might have sent written comments on Kevin's book. I'm first going to read them for you and then I have some really um, fairly simple questions on um, uh, the desktop and I assume many of you will have lots of questions on them as well. So on Humani's comments, I'm just reading Humani's comments. Treated with tender loving care and kid gloves as one has to any fellow Marxist of a dwindling variety, I'll divide my comments into laudatory slash supportive and critical though dressed as constructive suggestions. In the first category, Anderson has to be congratulated for bringing our attention to aspects of Marx's work that never gained a great deal of foothold in Western Marxist scholarship. By this I mean that it goes beyond the logic of capital tradition, which to my mind lacks a necessary historical and material dimension of actually existing, developing, mutating capitalism that the world has experienced in real terms. This is more than putting color into the faint by number approach adopted by the logic types. The historical and material slash and ontological capitalism that Anderson speaks to here picks up on some important contributions made by two types of scholars. The first, represented by Theodor Shannon, Corrigan and Sayre, Eric Wolf and so on, regarding the importance of colonial capitalism as an intrinsic rather than contingent phenomenon, both for capitalism as practice and an organization of social relation, forms of labor and accumulation, and theorizing capital. This tradition has become equals to the last 25 years or so. It's good to see somebody develop it and add a new dimension. The second type of scholars who have been concerned about capitalist development as a constantly expanding system and therefore the importance of the margins to the center has been Paul Barron in the political economy of growth, Harry Mandel and his work on imperialism, and the general understanding of what has come to be called critical development studies, including Wallerstein's world systems. While these authors were not primarily interested in theorizing Marx, in their empirical work and theorizations they made enormous contributions to understanding not only the transitions, and capitalism today, but also the importance of Marx's thought for understanding what Marx said in the manifesto about the bourgeoisie's restless penetration and transformation of the world. Anderson's reading gives us a way to complement our understanding of capitalism as a world phenomenon. Thus, the artificial distinction between so-called development studies and studies of capitalism is rendered obsolete. I might disagree with him a little bit here, but that's uh, let that go for now. <laughs> Anderson's work also points out the spurious nature of the view that Marx was a one phony show in how he outlined the politics of revolution and change in determined and uh, change and the linear stages theory of history. Anderson is to be congratulated for bringing to the view, especially <coughs> Marx's multilinear thoughts of how socialism or communism did be arrived at by showing the change in Marx's own thought from the 1853 position on historical action and agency to the stage of late Marx where Russian village community forms would also be the basis for a revolutionary transformation. The question of history making and historiography became non-deterministic and complex. Thus countries not yet capitalist would not have to wait until they became capitalist to develop their revolutionary historical path. Anderson's careful exposition of this matter challenges the conventional Western Marxist wisdom of cultivation for the need for cultivation of dependency among the colonies to play the game of follow the leader. Anderson's book shows us a heavy two-way traffic of the margins, and she puts it within quote, 
for Marx's central political epistemological insights and the importance of Marx as a valuable guide in the labyrinth of third world revolutions. To remember Fanon, we need to stretch Marx for understanding history and revolution in colonial capitalism rather than abandon him. Critical race theory and its historiography is impossible without historical materialist framework. Anderson shows that, shows that successfully in Marx's writing on the US on race, class, and slavery. Nationalism's revolutionary potentials, as Anderson points out, show in his writings on Ireland and Poland. In sum, Anderson presents us with a Marx, himself growing, changing, and revising as he lives his life in the history of his time. In the second category of comments, this is the critique press disconstructed. Uh, we feel the need to have more discussions and outlines of the very ideas that Anderson's text evokes. Devoid of that, the text has a certain standalone quality. As Anderson has tacitly relied upon much that his living and late comrades have presented him as ways of thinking about a complex dynamic mass and equally complex theories that do not fall within the discursive center and margin. In his later work, it would have been a pleasure to see what Anderson has to say about critical development theories, for example, or Lenin or Luxembourg's understanding of imperialism and nationalism in the light of Marx's views, or for that matter, a more situated and in-depth discussion of the Asiatic mode of production debate so vital in the late 70s and 80s. Equally, it would be important for us to know more about the active historical and political scholarship or explorations conducted in China and India, for example, in the early 20th century on. Among old Indian communist scholars, for example, the works of Rajni Pamdas and other exiled Indian communists, as well as the theoreticians of the rising communist movements in India and China, would help us get a fuller view and help developing Anderson's argument further. We might add Nambudrikar, as, as uh, Vijay was saying. Also important is the challenge to the two-stage theory of revolution thrown up in the course of Chinese communist development to be found in the work of Mao. Um, Anderson's insights into Marx's changing view of revolutionary agency and social relations brings to the fore the fundamental errors of Bill Warren's reductive teleological reading of third world liberation movements. Warren's view, which, in, which still in some form dominates political unconscious of Western Marxists, and we've all loved this point, could be better critiqued by comparing Warren's views with what Anderson finds in Marx. In conclusion, two main points are to be made. One, that there is really no need to ignore Marx's then common patriarchal perception and protect him from Edward Said or feminist criticism. The notion of ambiguity doesn't do much to give a positive or critical spin to Marx's use of the lines from Goethe's divan, which signal to the need of need for forcing the breaking of the hymen so that a woman may learn to enjoy sex. The fact that virginity can end and a happy sex life ensue becomes eclipsed by practically justifying rape as colonialism becomes the avenue through which the third world steps into. Speaking metaphorically and equally poetically, the fairy tale of Sleeping Beauty, in which the prince kisses the princess into her sexual awakening, though still a patriarchal perception, allows us not to confuse the kiss for the rape. <laughs> this is only humanity, right? Yes. <laughs> the criticism of Said's perception of colonial discourse in Marx by now has become a cliche. Equally, a discussion regarding who actually influenced Marx into temporarily rendering it into a racist colonial histori historiography detracts from Anderson's valuable argument in the main text. Let us say that Marx and many others, in fact all major European intellectual thinkers, lived, lived in the shadow of that zeitgeist, from the cheapest penny dreadfuls to the works of the most erudite European scholars. The same racializing and otherizing political common sense persists. How else can we explain our present day reporting about Afghanistan, Iraq, or Palestine, or the debates about the hijab? 
The second point is that this valuable contribution suffers from its title. Where the word margin should have been put in quotation marks. The error of the discourse of margin and centers is what the text helps us to challenge. And yet, in some way, is influenced by it. Though a rose may smell as sweet by any other name, the difference between a natural phenomenon like a rose and a conceptual phenomenon like a book is highly dependent on the discourse that exerts a strong pressure in the case of a book and casts a shadow on it, sometimes unbeknownst to us. The highly scholarly book, which draws on hitherto unpublished material of Marx and brings many insights into one place, could be said to both revive and start a direction in Marx studies. I, for one, look forward to more of Anderson's work. So. does not 
uh, and therefore marginalized <coughs> in some actual practices. Is, is it a problem of thought which we have, which is not only geographically uh, locatable, but it's something more fundamental in the way we think of struggles and transformation. So I will end with that small question and then you might be over.
no transformation but struggles. That to me is the important uh, <coughs> theme that I'm trying to work out and who gets to determine. It's linked to the other question of official history, subaltern histories, etc. I have read Samir Amin a lot and especially the thesis on delinking uh, where Amin uh, in a very important period, in fact during the NIO struggles, uh, Amin put forward the thesis of delinking and it's very interesting in the South Commission archives I read Amin's contribution, they invited him to give a contribution, you know, you have to imagine this is a, a group of people, many of them former heads of state, etc. They turn to Dakar Senegal and ask Amin to write a contribution and he provides a contribution but it is uh, really quite stunning how uh, the contribution cannot work for them and in a way I think with as this uh, globalization takes off in a much more advanced sense, it becomes harder to imagine delinking as a form. Just, I'm putting that out there. Now, many struggles, no transformations. Uh, I read an essay in New Left Review by uh, Tariq Ali, which I liked a lot, where I think the editors on the cover had put something like, no Chavez in the Middle East, or something like that. I don't know, maybe you remember the title. Chavez in the Middle East, or something like that. I thought that was a very interesting statement, you know, if you do a thought exercise, where is the Chavez in Southeast Asia, where is the Chavez in New blah blah blah, you know, not to say Chavez is the Godhead, but where are the breakthroughs, regional breakthroughs, there are many struggles, we haven't scaled up the struggles, and it's interesting, one of the features that I found fascinating in the South Commission is this idea that where is the communication across struggles, I mean, I've encountered the World Social Forum, Kind of play. But still I don't feel the communication across struggles is as robust as they should be. You know, are people learning from each other? Have we resorted to a kind of cultural particularism, regional particularism? These struggles work here, they are not scaled up, they cannot be transferred across continents. Have we reverted to that? Many of the major struggles are indeed like that. Then there's fear of criticizing each other. I mean, I was very interested in a uh, left meeting in New Delhi, uh, Hezbollah sent a, a person to speak and the person spoke and then Ajaz Ahmed stood up and criticized Hezbollah for its policies regarding uh, gender rights for instance. And the Hezbollah person responded, you know, I mean, are there those for us to have those kind of discussions? Do we take mass struggles that we don't like seriously? You know, that have some potential, they are semi-nationalist struggles maybe, what is, the, what is the progressive character in those struggles? We are so quick to dismiss things. Are we able to find modes of critique, find modes of affiliation, find ways to push struggles? I think that's the other thing. So one, I think, is the question of, you know, where is a big breakthrough able? Is the delinking strategy possible? I don't think it's possible at this point. I don't think I see it happening. If you look at the trade between South America and North America, or South America and Europe, it's extremely high. Even the great uh, bluster of Bolivarianism cannot delink from North American markets as yet. You know, so what is the prospect of delinking? It's uh, it's an interesting horizon. I don't see it. Then the second point was an information point. Are people able to communicate? Are they able to mutually struggle? Are they learning and growing from each other? Or have we the answers and are unable to listen to other people's blocks? You know, that there are struggles, there are blocks. Are we saying you are not reaching up to some kind of required minimum radicalism, therefore I don't even want to listen to you? Are we engaging with them, pushing them, trying to create uh, you know, the space to have that engagement? You know, where is the space between, say, radical Marxism and these forms of whatever it is, inchoate nationalisms? Is there that space to have a debate or are we simply dismissive? So that's the second thing I would say. And the third thing on the question of transformation, Obviously, there's a measurement problem. I mean, when do you, when does, it's a quantity quality issue. When does the quantity of struggles or when does the quantity of new developments make a qualitative break? You know, uh, I enjoyed reading Zizek's comments on the Lenin of 1917, where he gauged Zizek moving, you know, Lenin moving very quickly, Zizek moves quickly anyway, but <laughs> Lenin moving very quickly you know, from one position to another as the events proceeded and was guided by events and helped shape events. I think that's a very interesting thing that we need to learn from the suppleness of thinking, following events, tracking events, critiquing events, trying to intervene, pushing events. 
I mean, that I see as, as how we will come to it. We will come to an understanding of when transformation is occurring. And maybe I should end with a little poem uh, that will uh, lull you into the event for this evening. May I? Okay. Jump Kavi, this is from Fares. It's just a little poem. Uh, if you want the translation, you come and I'll give you a hug and tell you. Otherwise, just enjoy the words. It's basically Orientalist exoticism. Enjoy this. <laughs> जब कभी बाजार में बिकता है मजदूर का गोश्त जब कभी बाजार में बिकता है मजदूर जब कभी बाजार में बिकता है मजदूर का गोश्त शहराओं पे गरीबों का लहू बहता है आग से सीने में रह रह के उबलती है नबूज मेरे दिल पे मुझे काबू ही नहीं रहता है थैंक यू वेरी मच